Sadly, I get completely stationed. Billing calls down with the Ace of Hearts, Queen of Clubs, and earns himself the enormous bozo of the day tag. Ladies and gents, it's time for your weekly dose of cash game poker education. And what better way to enhance our skills today than to look at six 200 zoom spots where I had the chance to bluff the river. You're going to see a bunch of over betting on the river today, so if you're the sort of player who struggles to get those really big bluffs into your game, then today's video is going to help you add a new skill to your poker arsenal. And if you enjoy today's video, don't forget to smash that like button so that Carrot Corner Poker Education can continue to churn out free, quality poker lessons for you here on YouTube. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, then please do so now because from the 1st of July, when the Carrot Poker School, the highly awaited cash game course, is selling, we're going to be churning out multiple YouTube videos every week. You're going to want to know as and when those go live. Now let's get to the action and do some river bluffing. All right, let's get into this. So a player with a Paul Gascoigne avatar goes ahead and opens on the button and we defend the King of Hearts 10 of Spades in the big blind. If you don't know who Paul Gascoigne is, you are probably not from the UK or France or Germany or Europe at all or even South America or from anywhere that likes soccer slash football. You're probably from the United States, just saying. That's okay though, we won't judge you too harshly. We go ahead and make the call here and the Ace of Hearts comes on the turn. The flop call is actually a really pivotal moment in the hand because at this juncture, there's a key shift in range equality. If we just go back and watch this slow motion replay for a second here, Gaza bets we call. So while our opponent on the button is going to be betting a lot of terrible air hands like Jack-10 of diamonds, Jack-8 of diamonds, Queen-Jack off and things of this nature, we're not going to be calling that wide. That means that equities shift in our favour and although our opponent does have a nut advantage now, they don't have a range advantage and that's further offset by the appearance of this very equalising ace of hearts on the turn. When we call flop, our range actually shifts towards things that had a reason to hang around whereas our opponent will be betting random trash hands. Therefore, we have the equity advantage and that's going to mean that we expect a lot of theoretical fold equity later in the hand. So when we check here and our opponent checks behind on the turn we reach a key pivotal river situation. This is one of these scenarios guys where you need to be aware of a pattern that's going to come up time and time again that's really going to help your poker decision making in these spots. When the jack of spades comes down on the river particularly what this does is it reduces the showdown value of our king high. You could have made an argument for checking before the appearance of this card, but now our hand is just further down our range and less likely to win by checking. Given that we still maintain a lot of the advantage we garnered on the flop by calling, this is going to be a spot where we want to turn the bottom of our range into a bluff. While we can have hands that are lower down than this, I believe this is definitely still low enough to bluff and it has a very useful blocker for the overbet sizing. This is a mandatory bluff spot, range advantage, terrible hand, you've got to bluff these situations and I like an overbet for this hand. We would be overbetting pretty frequently here with flushes, full houses, maybe some 4x and therefore we can definitely have this as a bluff. The way I like to go about constructing a bet size on the river when I'm bluffing is to start by asking myself what my value hands would be. If I reach this spot with enough combos that are strong enough for overbetting, I will have an overbet range in my bluff region as well. This is a pretty good bluff, a good spot, and you know, we'll get it through most of the time, sometimes it won't. One week from the release date of this video, on Friday the 1st of July 2022, I present to you the Carrot Poker School, only at CarrotCorner.com. The Carrot Poker School is a completely unique, academic and thorough course on No Limit Hold'em cash games. In the Carrot Poker School, I have spent hundreds of hours compiling and recording top-notch material that's very slickly presented and professionally edited to give you guys the best possible cash game learning experience. The Carrot Poker School is my blood, sweat and tears. It's everything I could have possibly done on No Limit Hold'em cash games to give people a fighting chance at learning about poker theory. The Carrot Poker School is separated into three different grades. Grade 1 is for newer players who maybe have some grasp of poker theory but not very much and would like to take things from the beginning. However, Grade 1 is not for people who are entirely new to the game. Grade 2 is a more intermediate level for players who are already fairly versed in some of the ins and outs of poker theory but would like to take their skills to the next level. 
Then we have Grade 3, an advanced course for people with already very strong GTO foundations and who are already performing well at the tables. No matter who you are, I maintain that you can get the most out of the Carrot Poker School by signing up to our full scholarship and getting all three grades and saving £500 while you're at it. If you're watching this after the 1st of July 2022, then you know where to go to get your foothold in the theory of No Limit Hold'em cash games. It's CarrotCorner.com for the Carrot Poker School. And let's get back to the video. In this next hand, we open the King Queen of Diamonds in the cutoff and get 3-bet by a reg on the button. Yellow means reg. So we decide to go ahead and call and I snap check this flop because I'm an absolute moron. If I was actually thinking here, I would have realized that this is a board on which I definitely need to have a donk bet range. There aren't many boards where I'd go as far to say that you need to have a donk bet range, but this is one of them because this board is infinitely better for the cutoff caller than it is for the button 3 better. Just imagine the composition of each range and how asymmetric they actually are. The cutoff's range is going to contain loads of density in the pocket pair region, whereas button is going to be more polarised between really big pairs that have been devalued here and big cards which are just trash. What that means is that the cutoff player will Will have way more of the pair plus straight draw like fives and nines, way more of the pair plus straight draw on the board like eight nine, more two pair like seven six or eight seven, more sets like eight sevens and sixes, and less horrible big cards like the king queen offsuit because that's going to four bet a lot pre flop, and less horrible big cards like the king jack offsuit because that's going to fold a lot pre flop. That means we have a big range advantage, and you don't want to build a checking range when your range advantage is massive. You could range bet one third pot here as the caller of the previous street, and I think that's how you should play the spot. Anyway, we auto check like a donkey and Bill and checks back and we end up in a turn situation where having checked all of our range on the flop, that's what we were accidentally doing, we've actually landed on this turn with an absolutely colossal range advantage. The 4 is a card that accentuates further the asymmetry between cutoff's range and buttons very much in cutoff's favour, giving the out of position player tons more straights and things like that to go with the already strong range that they had on the flop. So we're going to be playing a really high frequency big bet strategy here because we actually land on this turn with both a range advantage and a nut advantage to boot. Those are separate things and one common beginner error is to lump them up in the same bag. We reach our river spot on the 10 of clubs, another good card for range because we're actually quite rich in hands like pocket nines here as well. I had a quick scan through my range here and tried to find examples of hands that were actually bad here and I was really struggling. I just can't think of too many combinations we reach this node with at high frequency that have air and I can think of tons of value hands and therefore we want to go ahead and pull the trigger often. The reason I didn't overbet here is that Villain does have a lot of 9s in this configuration and this is an uncapping card to their range making 10s and 9s get there. On a brick card like a 3 or a deuce I would have strongly considered very big sizes. I can probably overbet here as well, but I figured with blockers to hands like kings and queens I maybe just wanted to use a smaller bet size that those hands might consider calling sometimes. My blockers are going to become worse here if I start to filter my opponent's range to only straights and sets for continuing. So I decided to use, I think, a B75 in this spot. Although it wouldn't shock me if I used a small overbet, but yeah, this is, this is the standard sizing. And I got snapped off by a straight. What are you going to do? Don't judge your bluff too harshly. If your opponent folds, the top of their range or the near top of their range to 75% pot, you are playing against an absolute nitty idiot, my friends. The fact that this player didn't fold this hand doesn't make them stationary, it doesn't make your play bad, and you shouldn't take the fact that you got called by a 5 here as any sort of feedback whatsoever. Of course Villain's going to call with a 5, but he hardly ever has one. In this next spot we get to do battle heads up with a weaker player, small blind versus big blind, Villain opens, we make the call, and Villain checks the flop. When a weaker player checks to you on this kind of board, you can say one thing with a pretty high degree of confidence, that most people of this player type are under-protecting their checking range on a node like this. What that means is that Villain likely has a few too many combos like Ace Queen, Ace King, Ace Jack, big cards in general, Broadways with backdoor flush draws, things of this nature, and just has less of the higher EV front door flush draws, sets, and overpairs than they should. Therefore, I think what's probably just an optional but high frequency bluff in theory becomes a mandatory bluff in reality, and we start by betting the flop. Villain thinks for a minute and then makes the call, and we head on over to the six of diamonds turn. The six is not a terrible card for our range. 
I don't think 6x is a massively abundant hand in the small blind range, and I do think that flush draws are better at too high a frequency on the flop. I think villain's range is disproportionately heavy in two Broadway cards here, possibly with a diamond, and my plan is quite simple. I'm going to bet, and then I'm going to bet again. I actually think that when people call the flop here, they very often end up calling this turn, although not always, and I think a lot of our gain in fold equity actually happens on the river. The river is a three, a further scare card to things like big pairs, kings, queens, jacks, aces, etc. And so I think the fold equity just probably soars up a little bit further here. I don't typically like the term scare card, but when you're against a weaker player, it very much does play out like that sometimes, where they just begin folding their over pairs because it's now four straight and three flush. I don't think we need to overbet here, and I think Villain does have some tricky trappy flushes in their range sometimes. I don't think a massive bet is necessary on average here to garner the fold equity that we need to get against things like pocket kings, so I just opt for 75% pot. What I'm doing here is attempting to find the sweet spot between betting enough to make hands of that nature fold, while not overpaying for the fold equity when I run into something like a flush. Villain thinks for a second, I get the sweat, and then, sadly, I get completely stationed. Villain calls down with the ace of hearts, queen of clubs, and earns himself the enormous bozo of the day tag. And that's just the way it goes sometimes, guys. You know, you can't infer from this that they never fold or never bluff the weaker players or anything of this nature. No, some of them are folding absolutely their whole range here. Others are calling the ace of hearts, queen of clubs. It's just your luck. It's just who you run into. A six nine of spades is a fairly cute looking hand. I have to say there's something quite symmetric and nice about it. We decide to call the inevitable bet on the flop. I think the, the blue tag players, the, the weaker ones, are typically just going to be betting this flop a lot without thinking when they go one third pot. Another thing that they're going to do is check back the turn with a very capped range. So when you polarize and then you condense, what happens is that your range becomes really shit. Because when you polarize, you're basically saying, I've got a value bet or I've got a bluff. And then when they condense, their range is getting squashed towards the middle. So if you're kind of saying, I've got good stuff and then I've got bluffs, and then on the turn you say, I don't have that much good stuff, you actually have a really weak range. In game theory terms, you're meant to have a super weak range when you bet flop and then check back on the turn, and you're meant to be folding the river a lot. It's a fallacy that people are always defending the right amount of the time to make your bluffs indifferent. In theory, people fold their range a lot when their ranges are mismatched and their range is suffering. That's exactly what's happening with Villain here, and so we reach the river again with the familiar pattern of big range advantage and terrible hand. When that's the case, you know what we've got to do. We've got to bluff. What sizing we use here isn't super important. On a completing river like a 4 where we have a few straights like 6-3 suited in our range, 8-6 suited, that sort of thing, I think we have a few more over bets than normal. Villain being an early position opener isn't really uncapped by this card, so we go for the over bet, we get the fold. I think we could use some smaller bets here as well, but I really love blocking some of his call downs. For example, Villain will want to call us here with a hand like pocket sixes because they block 6-8 six, and 6-3. Six, so when we over bet with a 6 in our hand, we have blockers to some of their best bluff catchers. I like over bet with this combo. Queen 8 of clubs now, another speculative big blind hand, but we love to play these. Bilbo Teabaggins decides to open cute avatar, cute name, and we flat. 8.5 out of 10 for thematic avatar name sort of general vibe from this player, I would say. High rating. We could mix a bit of three bet here, that's why you see me hesitating. I'm not Hollywooding, I'm not like, oh, maybe I've got queens and I want to slow play. Yeah, I'm going to get this guy. I'm not doing that. I'm just I'm literally just RNG and see if I want a three bet this time. Five three deuce comes. I don't want to raise all of the time here. I could also build a leading range, and this time I actually remembered, by the way, on the flop, I did roll a check, and then I decided to check call, because I then rolled a check call. So basically, my hand has just jumped through an obstacle course where it's gone, D -d 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 okay, we have reached the first mix. We can either lead or we can check. Let's check. D -d 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 oh, another decision, another fork in the road. We can either raise or we can call. And then we roll the RNG again, and it's like, let's call. So this hand is actually being randomized twice in the space of like five seconds. That's what us nerds do, guys. We randomize twice within the space of five seconds. We're basically supercomputers. Like, you have no fucking chance against us, sorry. So then we get to the turn and we decide to tank a little bit, because why not? And then we lead. Why do we lead? Because the six turn is amazing for the big blind. Don't just think about, oh, you check called the previous streets. I have to check. No, you can do what you want. In No Limit Hold'em, you can bet as much as you want. In Hold'em, you can bet whenever you want. When it's on you and that little bar is counting down, you have the chance to bet, so consider it. 
building calls, we get the Six of Spades River, and now we come to another fork in the road where people like to say something that can be very misleading. Sometimes you will hear people say, Well, you can't bluff the plastic flash drawers. You can only bluff when you don't get the plastic flush draw. And the issue with this idea is that Busted flush draws are only bad in two situations. Firstly, when you're not in a great world for your range and you're going to have to be giving up a lot. This is actually a fantastic card. Again, for our range, we've had like basically the dream flop, the dream turn and the dream river for our range here. We've now overtaken all the villains over pairs with 6x as well as with our straights and full houses and all the other nonsense that we just crushed villain with here. So this is anything but a bad world for our range. Secondly, we only have one card that's actually blocking the busted flush draw because the eight of clubs isn't really opening from this position too frequently and then taking a line where it checks back flop, calls, turn and lands on this river. So really we just have one busted flush draw blocker in a spot that we just have so many value bets and just really have to bluff with the bad hands that we get here with almost irrespective of their blockers. Okay, maybe we can give up with something like ace, 10 of clubs, king, queen of clubs here when the blockers are really bad. But when we have a hand like Queen 8, and the 8 is actually unblocking most of Villain's folds, I think we definitely have to follow through here. In terms of sizing, we can think about what our value range is up to, and when we have a hand like a Bolt or a Straight, or even Trips here, I think we can consider a pretty large bet. The better region of that is going to use over bets here for sure, because we have such a capped versus uncapped configuration here, where the cutoff is just far more capped compared to the big blind. So we did over bet, and Bubble Teabaggins folds and therefore we did the right thing, right? Yeah guys, you with me? Therefore it was good? No, it doesn't work that way. It was good because we only had one negative blocker in a spot that's amazing for our range where our range is dominating him and that's why we did it. We didn't do it because like we knew he was gonna fold and we owned his soul. Sixes now, and this is a hand in which we don't bluff the river. What? I thought this was a YouTube video about bluffing the river. Well, how can we not? bluff the river if we have the chance to bluff the river because you don't always want to be mindlessly aggressive you want to be mindfully aggressive and every time we've bluffed so far we've basically outlined two key guidelines we've said firstly that theoretically our bluff is good because the hand has the right removal effects or blockers or the spot is really good for our range so we just have to bluff and in this hand we actually check all the way to the river it's kind of a different spot to those ones we looked at earlier where we gain a big range advantage by condensing our range and calling an earlier bet here we just check check on the flop which is a bit weird a lot of people just bet this flop a lot, but that's fine. And then check check on the turn as well. So we actually reached this river in a completely different way. We've actually retained the range disadvantage here. Our range has retained its feebleness and villain's range, while it's capped a bit, is still going to be much higher equity than our own range. So what this means is that while we do want to bluff some combos, we want to be careful that we're not just bluffing everything because there will be hands now theoretically that are negative or losing bluffs because they have their own blocker properties in a spot where we're not really due any extra fold equity. So bad blockers tend to lose money in spots that are not that good for your range. However, we still need a bluffing range and I think this hand could be in it. And I think one reason why this hand could be in it is that sixes is not a particularly likely hand for our opponent to be folding on the river. The reason for that is that they're going to be folding more hands like jacks, queens, 10x, king x, potentially hands of this, of this nature, something like sixes is not always going to 3-bet preflop. When it does, it's often going to have bluffed before now because it's very low down the opponent's range. So these are definitely reasonable cards to bet with on these nodes. It doesn't matter whether we have a spade here that's like completely irrelevant. It's a six of spades in a 3-bet pot, right? So we can bluff here. The problem is more an exploitative one, and the reason I chose to just not roll the dice on this and give up is that I strongly feel is that I strongly feel that when we get to this node on the game tree, Villain has some very obvious bluff catchers sitting in front of them. Like they're going to have queens, they're gonna have king x, they're gonna have 10x, and it's gone check check all the way to the river. And I think it's fairly easy just to flick in a call with those hands. However, I think if we were to go massive here, like 2x pot, 3x pot, 4x pot, now we're talking. Because we do have pocket sevens, we do have tens full and we do have queen jack. We have hands that we slow played up until this point. So the reason I rejected bluffing here like a total bozo and just checked was that I was only imagining making a smaller bet. And I do think a smaller bet is over defended too. I don't think people mix enough folds with a hand like king queen in this spot. So if we do bluff here, which we didn't, and villain ends up showing up with king queen, then we're going to see 
not enough folding going on with a combo like this. We didn't bluff here, we didn't get called, we just went check check. But I think if we go huge, then Villain probably doesn't have very many slow plays here across three streets, and we can conceivably still be slow playing really good stuff on the turn, we're allowed to check raise instead of betting there, so I do think we should have considered just the immortal bomb here, just like the 3x pot, the jam, like what are you going to do about it? Let me jam for 10x the pot and ask you whether you want to bluff catch okay, we need like 90 something percent fold equity, but we may well have it in that situation. So I, so I don't actually think this spot is underfolded if we get our sizing up to a certain point, but I think when we're betting like 75% pot, I just don't think people are mixing enough fold with jacks, queens, king, queen, jack, 10 to that one bet because the hands that they land with there are naturally clearly hands that beat bluffs. Whereas in some other spots, you might bluffing and villain has to call the case high or king high or something, and that's harder to do just instinctively. So I actually think there's a few things wrong with this hand. Like firstly, I should have considered just bombing turn, because at some frequency I do want to take pocket pair with spade blocker, because those eat up the outs to their flush draws and make them less able to out draws. So that's one good thing, but but secondly, we just have set redraw and we're very low down in our range and we benefit a lot from fold equity. So I think we can have some bluffs on the turn here. Having not bluffed the turn, I stand by my read that I don't like bluffing a normal size on the river. However, I think that had I reached the conclusion that some of my value bets are absolute monsters here and I can easily have like a 3x pot range and then found that, I would have quickly realized that I quite like that now with my hand. Again, villain has a range advantage, but we my friends have a nut advantage, they are not the same thing. That's really important, draw that distinction and it'll lead you to the conclusion that while we don't want to bluff often here, we want to bluff sometimes and we want to bluff really big sometimes because we do have those strong value hands. If you've made it this far in the video, then you are just the type of viewer that makes this channel what it is. If you have not subscribed, please do so because I know I can count on you to watch loads of my future videos and you know you can count on me to improve your game, I hope. Hopefully you now know when to bluff, when not to bluff a little bit better, and you can see it really does a lot come down to the range versus range picture. If you want more educational tips such as this, head on over to caracorner.com and check out our extensive array of different products, including from the 1st of July, the Carrot Poker School. It's gonna be live and it's ready to be picked up from next Friday, one week from when this video comes out. See you next week for more fun and games and education and learning from EP Clark and Carrot Corner Poker Education. Bye for now, guys.